Well, I'm 90 years young. <laughs> Welcome to Afternoon Briefing this Thursday. Greg Jenner joining you from Parliament House here on Nullarbor Country. And I'm Frank Kelly joining you from Sydney on Gadigal Land. And Greg, two more sleeps. Are we there yet was the question I was going to put to you, Frank. It almost <laughs> feels like it, but not quite. Not quite. In fact, there's no rest for the wicked, Greg. With two days to go, the final spurt of can campaign activity is on. It's a fast and furious blitz of targeted seats by the leaders and the uh, star performers of both parties right up until polling day. Uh, soon we'll be joined by Tanya Plibersek, who's in Cairns in the Liberal seat of Leichhardt. But, Greg, where are the leaders? Well, Scott Morrison began day 39 in Tasmania and is ending it in Sydney. Anthony Albanese started there before a swing through multiple seats in and around Brisbane. Yeah, they really were upping the pace, weren't they, Fran? And inevitably, when it comes to the issues... The economy was the only game in town, no matter which town each leader was actually in. Because Labor came out with its tallied up costs from its election promises and also because the Bureau of Statistics reported the unemployment rate for April and yes, finally, it did have a three in front of it. <laughs> That's a bit chilly. I'm for higher wages. And I'm for higher wages by ensuring that we get unemployment down. Morning. Figures can be now put on how tough families are doing it around Australia. Yeah, a bunny rabbit goes on a chase. Look at that. The empathy I've been able to demonstrate is the empathy that comes with action. We need a government for this century. The times it is our intention will be changed. Open to interpretation. Our borders are closed. People are doing it tough. Doesn't even know whether the borders are open or closed. This guy doesn't know whether he's coming or going. Oh, oh, Labor. Labor even today, he wanted to run to the other end of the country, away from his own travelling media pack, so he wouldn't have to face questions. I am happy for the travelling party to go wherever you want to go. If you want to go to uh, where we're headed in Brisbane and see me hand out how to vote, that's fine. And so on and on it goes. And today, well, first we got the numbers, then we got the political point scoring. Two key economic moments today, Labor's long-awaited election costings and the latest unemployment number. Going first to Labor's costings, Greg, after all said and done, they have delivered deeper deficits, bigger deficits than the government to the tune of $7.4 billion over four years. Now, that's a smaller deficit blowout than many had been expecting, but it is nevertheless $7.4 billion more than the Coalition is spending. So right for a scare campaign, nevertheless. And then there's the question of budget repair. When do we get to that bit under well, Labor's plan? Well, I think the answer, Fran, is significantly after the scare campaign part, because that's already started. And no time, well, let's be honest, in, say, the next decade, regardless of who wins on Saturday, Fran. So, the government's racking up deficits of almost $80 billion. $50 billion, then $47, and $43, just over the next four years, for a total of around $220 billion worth of extra borrowing. That then Fran becomes the envelope in which Shadow Treasurer Jim Chalmers has had to work. And his political calculation seems to be that because it's such a fat and bulging envelope, it wouldn't matter politically if you stuffed an extra $7 billion into it. So when this announcement uh, did finally come, it came complete with an explanation from Jim Chalmers and from Anthony Albanese that these aren't so much extra spending initiatives, Fran, but rather worthy investments, which in theory, should generate some return to the budget and the broader economy at some yeah, unspecified time in the future. That figure of a difference between us and the government is $7.4 billion. And it's based upon the three big things that we will do to produce an economic dividend, based upon our investment in how we grow the economy and we grow back stronger. Uh, those three investments, of course, are childcare that will boost productivity, 
and boost women's workforce participation. Their skills and training, our 465,000 fee-free TAFE places and our 20,000 additional university places that will help to deal with the skills crisis which is there. And our clean energy policies, our clean energy policies that will end the climate wars. It's the old good debt, bad debt argument, Greg, and Labor is hoping that, you know, the voters will listen closely and buy yeah. the fact that they're spending it well. And, I don't know, two days after the campaign, who's quite tuned in to that degree? But elsewhere, somewhere in the air between Tasmania and Sydney, Scott Morrison finally got the news he'd been hoping for in this election campaign. As you said, unemployment with a three in front of it, 3.9% to be exact. Mm. The lowest unemployment figure in 38 years. That's great news for a government spruiking its superior economic plan, but maybe it's also a sign of an economy facing all sorts of pressures, including workforce shortages and skills gaps. Uh, yeah, but they're not the sort of pressures that incumbent governments, let's face it, Fran, would want to dwell on a day and a half out from polling day. And the <laughs> Prime Minister, well, he certainly did not. Uh, what he did do, though, Fran, was parcel up the full suite of economic figures. Unemployment and Labor's alternative budget costings, with that extra $7.4 in deficits, into one grand sweeping Morrison economic statement. I think Australians think $7.4 billion is a lot of money. I really do. It is a lot of money. And on top of that, $52 billion in extra borrowings by the Labor Party for the government to own 40% of your home and other projects that actually put up electricity prices with the $20 billion they want to invest in the transmission grid out of time in the wrong places, which only puts up your electricity prices. What does all that do? Labor borrowing more, spending more. It puts pressure on interest rates. It puts pressure on inflation. It drives up the cost of living. The reason why Australia has been able to shield itself from many of these global pressures, we're not immune to them. And we won't be immune to them after the 21st of May either. We're not immune to them. And that's why the economic shield of strong fiscal policy that has maintained a AAA credit rating, that has got the unemployment rate down to 3.9 per cent, the lowest level in 48 years. This is an economic plan that is working and will continue to work for Australia. And on Saturday, you can vote for the Liberal national team to vote for a strong economy and to avoid the risk of a weaker one under a Labor Party that can't manage money and so they'll always come after yours in higher taxes. It was always going to come back to that line, Greg, and the uh, government was ready to pounce, knowing that Labor's deficit was going to be higher than theirs. I note that line, the Prime Minister there saying $7.4 billion is a lot of money. I think that's a lot of money. Will Labor go into great lengths today when they announce their higher uh, deficit over four years to point out that the government had spent $5.5 billion on cancelling the French right. subs contract, that it ended up with nothing. And Katie Allen talking at length about what she called the dodgy slush, um, slush fund of the government. So, you know, both sides kind of ready with their lines there. Yeah, I mean, I think in that minute and a half statement we got from Scott Morrison there, Fran, it really felt like that was his campaign uh, delivered in one and a half minutes. Makes us wonder what the uh, last five and a half weeks have been about. But anyway... It, I, just... I had that same thought as I was <laughs> listening, actually. Yeah. Why don't we dive into, since you mentioned it, uh, just a, a bit further detail on this Labor costings exercise. Uh, they're working on projections, like all budgets, of course, and... Uh, uh, we're told it's all been worked up with the support of the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office. Now, over four years, Fran, it promises $18.9 billion in extra spending, offset by $11.5 billion in extra savings or income to an Albanese government. Now, where would a large portion of that come from? You just alluded to this a moment ago, Fran. Think pork or waste, says Jim Chalmers. And if there's a theme of what of Katie's work and my work that we're presenting to you today is that if we do a bit less of the rotting and wasting which has defined a decade of the coalition in office then we can do more of the things that we truly value in this society and in our economy.
Well, as it was in the beginning, so it is towards the end that the economy remains at the centre of this election campaign. The government celebrating that unemployment figure at 48-year lows and Labor, as we've just been discussing, has laid out its costings. Well, Employment Minister Stuart Robert was across all of this and he joined us a short time ago from Sydney. <laughs> Stuart Robert, welcome back on Afternoon Briefing. Unemployment now stands at levels unseen since 1974. So does this make Scott Morrison the goth Whitlam of his age? It demonstrates, Greg, that the Morrison government's economic plan is working and working well. We're seeing unemployment come down. Yesterday we saw wages start to move up. Unemployment today at 3.853%, but rounded up, of course, to 3.9%. At least it's easier for Mr Albanese to try and remember now. Just demonstrates that the opportunity for people to get into work is here right now. 92,000 full-time Australians into work, 88,000 part-time less. So the conversion from part-time to full-time, the opportunity for Australians is looking really, really good. No, I note the, the figures you cite there. Unemployment with a three in front of it is undoubtedly good news. But I wonder if in the blossom of success we actually see here the seeds of a grim harvest ahead because at 4,000 jobs created in the month, it's actually very low and much lower than expectations. Why so low? When you pull apart the figures, in the last month, 25,000 Australians have come off the job seeker payment, 4,000 Australians have come off youth allowance other, uh, which is great. So that's 29,000 Australians that have come off payment. And the net figure of 4,000 additional jobs, 92,000 full-time jobs created, 88,000 part-time jobs have come off. And that's where your figure nets out. But when you combine not just the headline numbers, but also with the number of Australians, those 29,000 that are no longer on a primary welfare payment, that are now in work, and 92,000 more people in full-time work, these numbers are something that we can be pleased about and does show the confidence we can have going forward. But plenty of market economists in their analysis are basically suggesting the tightening jobs market is, in fact, to use their words, as tight as a drum. There's every possibility here, isn't there, that it could choke our economy, and pretty quickly too. There's always a balance between giving Australians a crack when it comes to jobs, and we're doing that, and the 29,000 people off payment in the last four weeks reinforces how the, the Morrison government's economic plan is working. But we combine that, of course, with bringing uh, people visa holders from overseas. Uh, now, Mr Albanese said this morning that the borders were closed. Clearly he had forgotten that over 900,000 visa holders have crossed our borders since the 20th of November last year when they opened up. And we're now some 300,000 uh, visa holders with work rights less than where we were in March 2020 before the pandemic. So we're right. almost caught up again, which is good getting that balance. But we are unashamedly giving Australians a crack first. Which does raise the question, when and what would it take for you to revisit and lift the migration cap of 160,000? Uh, might you have to, if re-elected, uh, have a review or a new budget like Labor is promising in six months to address that question? Is it too low? That's a permanent migration cap. Uh, but... But pre-pandemic, there were 1.685 million visa holders in Australia with work rights. So right now, there is some 300,000 less. And there's also 100,000 more bridging visa holders with work rights. So over 1.3 million visa holders with work rights. And of course, students normally having a 20-hour cap on the work that they can do each week. That's now unlimited to help ease the burden. So when you look at the number of non-Australians, so uh, visa holders in Australia with work rights. You can't just look at the 160,000 yeah. permanent migration. You must look at the total amount of visa holders, and that's over 1.3 million. Yeah, no, they are a good buffer to have, and in those numbers there's lo lots of flexibility. They come, they go. Uh, but uh, is there any circumstance in which you think the 160 permanent settlement numbers might have to be re-examined in view of these figures? Well, that 160 is is between 10 and 15% of the total visa holders 
with work rights. Uh, and that's why it's important to look at the whole. But it's also important to understand that our focus in, in the Morrison government and the focus of our economic plan is to get Australians into work. Mm. And that's what's great about seeing 29,000 Australians come off payment in the last four weeks and into full-time work, not dependent on the government anymore for the job seeker payment or youth allowance other. And 29,000 in a single month, unemployment down to 3.9%, uh, that tells us that the Morrison plan is working. And Great. if you remember, Greg, Jim Chalmers, it was the Labor Party that gave us one goal, one, one totem of success. They said this government should be judged on what happens when it comes to employment. Mm -hmm. Well, we inherited... Uh, and employment at 5.7, it's now at 3.9. In Labor's own test, the Morrison government's economic plan is passing with flying colours. Yeah, great news for those who are getting jobs, for sure. What about those who hold mortgages, though? Because Comsec analysis, this is just to cite one, says, based on today's figures, quote, we expect the RBA to lift interest rates by 25 basis points, a quarter of 1%, at next month's board meeting. Uh, that's a grim byproduct, isn't it, for, for millions of people from this low unemployment data? Well, Comsec aren't oracles. We'll wait and see what the Reserve Bank does. 29,000 people who are off payment in the last four weeks will be pretty thankful, Greg, in that respect. But keeping in mind, that's why there's over $100 billion of tax cuts coming forward. You've seen tax reduction of $40 billion since the pandemic. You've got $8.5 billion worth of cost of living adjustment uh, within the budget to assist people. And those, in terms of ordinary wages, can be expecting uh, a low and middle income tax offset from the 1st of July when their tax returns go in uh, of, of upwards to $1,500. Mm. So the, the inflation, which we know is the problem, we knew it was coming. Uh, we ensured that our tax deductions were there. We ensure the cost of living package was in the budget. None of this has come as a surprise to us. As a thoughtful government, we've been preparing economically for this, planning for this. And today's job numbers are a dividend and a demonstration that the economic plan of the Morrison government is working. Right. And it also highlights the choice, the choice Australians have got to stay with a solid economic plan or frankly, go with Mr Albanese, who today didn't even know that the Australian borders were open for All visa right. holders. Well, just on that choice, uh, your government running deficits, 78 billion, 56 billion, 47, 43. Why on earth would it make any difference if a Labor government incoming were to spread across those four years an extra $7.4 billion? Well, that's the number they're saying now, but for Labor, it's always a, an opening bid. It's never the final offer or the final amount. On top of that, Greg, they've got over $400 billion of what they call aspirational commitments, which is really what they want to do. But they learned in the 2019 election that if you put it down in paper, the Australian people will judge you. So they've dressed well, it up as Well, to be fair, they're not commitments because they, they haven't actually made them. Oh, no, they've just changed the word, Greg, from commitment to aspiration. We aspire to them, Labor says. And you can't believe Labor. Uh, they say it's, it's X number of billion dollars. Uh, it's not. That's their opening gambit. What they want to do is what they're saying they aspire to. That'll see massive pressure on interest rates. We've, we've seen this book before. We've heard this recording before, Greg. We know what Labor's like. They haven't just ditched their $387 billion worth of taxes from the last election. They haven't have uh, a change on the road to Damascus light experience, it's the same old Labor. Well, sorry. I think they might. you might find that they say they have, in fact, ditched uh, those tax proposals. Let's move on, though. You've covered a bit of ground in this final week. You're heading home to Queensland soon. Is the vote tightening for the Coalition in these final days? Elections are always tight. It's a great thing about the Australian democracy and the Australian people always make fine decisions uh, and, and they'll continue to make great decisions. It's certainly tightening. Uh, the undecided vote, I think, is now starting to look at the options and those choices that are clear between an economic plan that is delivering record low unemployment, record low, 29,000 Australians off payment in the last four weeks versus uh, an Albanese economic plan where he doesn't know the unemployment number, doesn't know the cash rate, and didn't know the borders were open. That's a choice for the Australian people, and I know they'll make a good choice, Greg. Let's see what they decide. Hopefully we might know as soon as Saturday night. Stuart Robert, thanks again for joining us on Afternoon Briefing. Great to talk to you. Thanks.
Well, Shadow Minister, Education Minister Tanya Plibersek is campaigning across the country in the dying days of this election campaign. She heads to Perth tonight, but I caught up with her earlier in the far north Queensland seat of Leichhardt, where Labor's trying to defeat the LNP local member, long-standing member Warren Inch. <laughs> Tanya Plibersek, thank you very much for joining us on Afternoon Briefing. It's a pleasure to be with you. Scott Morrison's key message throughout this campaign is that Labor can't manage money. Less than 48 hours to go before Election Day, Labor's finally released the costings, revealing a bigger deficit than the government. Have you just proven Scott Morrison's case? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, th this is a small difference. It's the difference between uh, 230 uh, 232 billion and 225 billion dollars but it's money that will be invested in the things that really matter and make a difference to Australians so it's an investment in cheaper childcare better early childhood education and care in education and training TAFE and universities and in cheaper cleaner renewable energy I mean it's a bit rich for a government that actually doubled our national debt before COVID-19 hit to be talking about managing money this is a government that has taxed more, has spent more and has wasted more than any government in Australian history. You think about the difference between what we'll spend over the next four years, what the government will spend over the next four years, about $7 billion. That's a lot less than this government wasted on paying JobKeeper to companies that saw their revenues increase sure. during COVID-19. Sure, it's but... about the same as this government has wasted on signing submarine contracts that they then cancel. But will people take in a detailed message about better debt or will they just hear bigger debt when the government says it and, you know, debt's a dirty word? Well, uh, you know, under this mob, we're heading to well over a trillion dollars of debt. Uh, the investments that we're making will take pressure off the cost of living for families. They'll get cheaper energy, they'll get cheaper childcare, they'll have better education and training, so they'll be able to upgrade their skills and move into higher paid jobs. Uh, it'll be good for the economy. We know that right across the country, wherever I go, I talk to employers who say they'd like to be open more hours a week, uh, more hours a day, more days a week, but they can't find the skilled staff they need. By investing in education and training, by investing in cheaper childcare, we make it possible for more people to be working, more people to have the skills that we need to grow our economy. That's great for everyone. It's great for those individuals who get more hours of better paid work. It's also really important for our economic development as a nation to invest in these productivity enhancing measures. The other figure voters will get today is that unemployment is at its lowest rate in 38 years. So there's higher debt from Labor, lowest unemployment from the government. Which number do you think might affect people's votes? And are you worried about this? Well, I'm, I'm, I've been travelling all over the country, Fran, uh, in recent weeks and uh, indeed over the last few years and literally everywhere I go, when I talk to Australians, they tell me that life's got harder under Scott Morrison. They tell me that their wages aren't keeping up with the cost of living. Uh, the price of everything's gone up. Childcare's gone up, power bills have gone up, petrol's gone up, groceries have gone up, rent's gone up, mortgages have started to go up. Everything's going up but wages. So uh, I think people are really feeling that in their hip pockets. They know that Scott Morrison's done nothing to help. Anthony Albanese, in contrast, has a plan to help, both by taking pressure off the cost of living with cheaper childcare, cheaper power bills, uh, and cheaper medicines, for example, but also by seeing an increase in wages. We support, uh, we support seeing uh, wages grow. As businesses increase their productivity, as our economy improves, we want to see some of that passed on to hard-working Australians as increased wages. They're not getting that under Scott Morrison. They're not getting that under Scott Morrison. And this government keeps promising that wages are just about to go up. They're wrong every time about that. The, we're in the dying days of this campaign. The polls are tightening. You're spending the next two days literally racing across the country from Queensland to Western Australia. You're in the, um, the Queensland seat of Leichhardt at the moment, which Warren Edge holds for the government on 4.2%. Does Labor really have its eyes on Leichhardt? Oh, I, I love campa campaigning with the light of faith here in Leichhardt because she knows this local community well and she's made a series of really important commitments that I think are very appealing. Yes, but, but can you win it? Uh, Do you think you can win it? Is that why you're there? 
Oh yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't be here if um, I, I wouldn't be here if we didn't have a shot at winning it. I think Allied is a fantastic candidate. I think our message about um, more secure work, higher wages, taking the pressure off the cost of living is really resonating here. We've made some really important local commitments, like investing to protect the reef, uh, an urgent care clinic locally, um, upgrading local um, roads, and in the. Torres Strait, um, wharves and other port facilities. Uh, I, I mean, this is a seat that is well within reach for Labor. We've got a great candidate and great policies that will make a huge difference to the people of Leichhardt. But if it's well within reach, and if you haven't convinced people by now, what can you tell them in this final 48 hours to convince them? Well, just today I was announcing 100 extra jobs for Cairns, an investment uh, in the Centrelink call centre here, which will, of course, be good for Centrelink uh, customers who won't have to wait as long on the phone. They'll be able to actually talk to a human wherever they are in Australia. They'll be able to talk to a human a bit more easily. But 100 extra jobs in this local economy makes a huge difference because those people are supporting 100 families. Those 100 families are spending in the local economy as well. Uh, it means that they're, you know, buying a cup of coffee on the way to work. It means they're taking the kids out for pizza on a Friday night. It's a, it's a very big investment in the local economy. And these sorts of local investments that will make a difference to the quality of life here in Cairns, I mean, uh, you know, upgrading the So what does that mean, though? Some last-minute pork barrelling might get some last-minute votes. Uh, it, it means that we are committed to delivering jobs on the ground in communities like Cairns all around Australia. Um, you were listening to Katie and Jim earlier today talk about the fact that we will cut uh, uh, billions of dollars of wasteful spending uh, on contractors and outsourcing, but reinvest that money in around a thousand extra full-time permanent staff in the Australian Public Service. We actually save money by employing people full-time and permanently rather than wasting money as this government has on contractors and outsourced labour. Uh, is, that's good for the people who are getting those full-time permanent jobs. It's great for communities like Cairns where they'll be based. It also saves money. It saves the Commonwealth budget money because instead of outsourcing, we're, uh, we're, bringing, that, we're bringing that work back in-house. Tanya Plibersek, Labor's run hard throughout this campaign on Scott Morrison's character. The polls, though, are showing that Anthony Albanese's approval rating have actually gone backwards during this campaign. Is that because voters don't know him yet or is it because they're getting to know him in this campaign and they're not particularly impressed? Look, the Leader of the Opposition is the toughest job in Australian politics, I think, and Anthony's done an, an incredible job. He's put absolutely everything into this role and he's come up with policies that will take pressure off the cost of living, that will help Australians make ends meet, that will see a pay rise for the lowest paid workers. He's prepared to invest in early childhood education and care, invest in aged care to care for the most vulnerable Australians and see a pay rise for that underpaid uh, workforce. Uh, he's backed policies that will actually finally end the climate wars that will mean that we've got cheaper, cleaner, renewable energy and the jobs that come with it. Um, he's made a commitment. Yeah, to but his approval rating hasn't sure gone up. We... It's gone backwards. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough job. Uh, Leader okay. of the Opposition is a tough job, but I'm sure that Anthony has the goods to be the Prime Minister of Australia uh, and we've got the policies that will make this a better, stronger, fairer country. Just finally, I want to get your view on the, uh, the AEC's announcement that some polling stations will be closed on Election Day because they don't have staff to run them, including one I know of at least one Indigenous community where the nearest polling station is four hours away. Are you worried about that? Is that good enough? No, it's really not good enough. I think all Australians would expect every Australian citizen to have the opportunity to vote in a federal election. So should and something be done about this? I think this? it's up to the... Well, of course, something should be done, and it's really up to the AEC to, um, to tell us what the solution is here. I mean, it, it is not good enough at this late stage to be saying that some Australians will miss out on the opportunity of voting. It's just not good enough. Some of those polling stations, including the one I mentioned, I think are in the seat of Leichhardt. Are you worried that in a tight race, could be a tight race in Leichhardt, you're there campaigning, it could make a difference to the outcome? Well, well, of course I am. I think it could make a, a difference in individual seats. But there's also a, a much broader and more fundamental principle at stake here. Every Australian citizen has the right to vote 
in an Australian election. It's the Australian Electoral Commission's job to make sure that that happens. They need to make sure that in this election, on Saturday, every Australian has the opportunity to vote. Tanya Plibersek, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Fran. Now, if you live in a marginal seat the Liberals either hold or want to win, you might have seen a highly experienced campaigner out chaperoning candidates, especially new and inexperienced ones lately. We're talking here about former Prime Minister John Howard, who's been on a trail that's taken him to Western Australia, South Australia and back across his home city of Sydney. Our political editor, Andrew Probin, caught up with John Howard for an assessment on where things stand during a rare, quieter day for the 82-year-old. John Howard, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're two days out from Election Day. What's your sense of where this contest is at? I think it's very tight. Um, unlike other elections, I don't have a strong feeling about the outcome. I mean, I know what I want to be the outcome, a Liberal victory, but um, I think it's very close and I think anybody who's followed the campaign and been involved in it, as I have, and I've been to every mainland state, it is very difficult to predict the outcome. You've been dispatched as somewhat of a pinch hitter for the Liberal Party. Lots of seats uh, have had your, you, you visiting. What's the mood of the electorate that you're picking up? Well, the mood, <clears throat> the mood is that the dominant mood, obviously, is that um, uh, a lot of people are still undecided. Clearly, when a government's been in power for almost 10 years, some people start to get a bit footloose. But I don't find that there's a lot of enthusiasm for Mr Albanese as an alternative Prime Minister. I went through 2007 when Kevin Rudd defeated me, defeated me quite decisively. I didn't like it, but it was the democratic result. But I knew then that I had a big fight because there was a sense in the community that they felt he would be an acceptable alternative. I don't find that with Anthony Albanese and Scott Morrison. Scott Morrison, he, he leads a, a nine-year-old government. That's, a, that's an old government in, in modern days. He's personally unpopular and people seem to be a bit grumpy after the pandemic. How on earth does he win? Oh, very easily. <laughs> because... Um, uh, he's got, you know, a bare majority at the moment, and unless there's a stronger tide of enthusiasm for the alternative, he can very easily win. But will he? I don't know. Um, uh, I'm being honest with you. I've followed a lot of elections, and I find this one extremely hard to pick. Now, you say he's unpopular. I don't pick that up uh, as I move uh, around the electorates, and I've been to a lot of electorates... Uh, in different states, I don't find him unpopular. That's the Labor Party narrative, but um, the Labor Party narrative obviously suits their electoral goal. Well, it's not just the, um, the Labor Party narrative, it's also found in polls. But you've campaigned alongside Catherine Deves. Did you have any anxiety that, um, that her campaign would bring other moderates' campaigns unstuck? No. Nah. No, I don't believe that for a moment. I thought she was a good candidate. I met her for the first time yesterday and she's a highly intelligent woman. She's got very strong connections with the electorate. She handled herself with dignity and poise and answered the questions and uh, uh, I don't think she's going to do any damage uh, except to the uh, vote of the current sitting member in Warringah. And I hope she does her a lot of damage. Scott Morrison told 7.30's Lee Sales uh, on Monday night that the Teal independents are getting traction in once extremely safe Liberal seats because he said that uh, these electorates were less vulnerable to the impacts of the economy. What's your theory? Well, there's a sense from some of the polls 
that they are getting traction, and I worry that some people in hitherto safe Liberal seats might say to themselves, well, I can deliver a message to the government uh, by voting for one of these, but somehow or other I can still have a Liberal government. Well, you can't. Uh, the contest is so tight. I would say to people in seats like uh, Goldstein and North Sydney and Wentworth, I'd say to them, uh, if you want at the end of the day to have a Liberal government but also send them a message, you can't do that by other than voting Liberal. Uh, if, you've, if enough of you vote for one of these independents, they're not really independents, you'll end up with a Labor-Green government. Uh, politics doesn't deliver halfway houses. It delivers outcomes. It's quite clear that the economy is a big issue of, in the final few days of this election campaign, as it always is in an election. When you came to government in 1996, you had uh, $96 billion in net debt. Whoever comes to government this time around will have a trillion dollar net debt to contend with. Do you think that budget repair has lost the political potency uh, that it once had? No, I don't think so. I think deep down people understand that there were reasons for this remarkably high level of debt. Uh, we had to inject that money into the economy because the government had closed the economy down in the interest of saving lives, of preserving people's good health in the face of the pandemic. So it was under a clear obligation to inject all that money, go into debt, and of course it's worked. Our economy is recovering better than any comparable ones around the world, and that is a remarkable achievement uh, for uh, Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg in particular. Uh, you risked your political hide by pursuing a GST. You, in fact, lost the popular vote in the 1998 election. Are you a bit disappointed that we aren't really having a debate about economic reforms, economic reforms that perhaps must be pursued in the next few years? Well, 1998 is um, uh, more than 20 years ago, and I think to try and draw comparisons between the circumstances of 1998 and the circumstances of, of, of today are, are pointless. Uh, the government clearly has a better track record on managing the economy than the Labor Party. Anthony Albanese has shown in this campaign a, an abysmal lack of comprehension of a lot of basic economic uh, things. And that's a worry for somebody who's going to preside over the government if he becomes Prime Minister. Uh, my uh, my question, of, though, Mr uh, Howard, is, is whether you believe that there is economic reform that should be pursued. But the question of whether economic reform and what character that should take is a matter for the current government. I'm not going to uh, uh, get into that at this stage simply because uh, they have laid out a program and there's been quite a lot of economic reform achieved by this government. I mean, the restructuring of the personal tax system, finally the Labor Party has been dragged into line on some of it, whether they can be... Uh, relied upon if they do win the election to stick to that commitment to another matter. But this suggestion that the government hasn't done any economic reform is completely wrong. And I think the housing proposal is a very important um, uh, structural change to how we deal with superannuation. I think it introduces some interesting options, but it doesn't undermine super. I know the unions and <clears throat> one of my predecessors as Prime Minister are running around saying shock horror um, what the government's doing will detonate superannuation, do nothing of the kind, it'll just give people a bit more control over their own money and I think that's a good thing and of course it's a great Liberal principle to give people choice. As, as you're aware the Solomon Islands has, has struck a military pact with Beijing, how is that this not a, a massive diplomatic fail? Oh, I don't think it's a diplomatic fail when um, uh, a country does something that you don't like. Um, it is a sovereign country, uh, and we have demonstrated over the years great friendship towards the Solomon Islands, and uh, we'll continue to do so. But the current leadership of the Solomon Islands has always been lukewarm. 
the current Prime Minister about Australia. He was lukewarm about Australia when I was Prime Minister. <laughs> so it's not something that can be blamed on Scott Morrison. So how, how would they... What's the best way, do you think, to heal this relationship, to, to get ahead of where Beijing's strategy is? Well, I think the best way of doing it is what the Prime Minister has outlined, patient diplomacy, um, uh, and I think uh, the government will continue to pursue that uh, if it continues to be the government after this coming Saturday. Do you worry about the relationship between China and Australia? Oh, I do. <clears throat> Any person who cares about our economic and diplomatic future should do so. China is our best customer. There are 1.4 million Australians who claim Chinese heritage. And it's very important that we strike the right balance. We can't surrender any of our liberal principles and our, uh, and I use that word in its sort of international sense, our commitment to liberal democracy. We've got to stand up for Australian values, but equally we shouldn't gratuitously throw rocks at China. We have to work on the relationship, and I think the Prime Minister and, and, and his predecessors on both sides, by and large, have got that balance right. Uh, lastly, John Howard, what's your advice to the next Prime Minister, be that Scott Morrison or Anthony Albanese? Well, um, I'll give advice um, uh, to whoever wins the election if it's uh, sought. They have laid out their programs. I hope the Australian people stick with somebody who's demonstrated a great capacity for leadership and resilience in very, diff very difficult circumstances. And uh, it's a great exercise in democracy, and uh, I hope Scott Morrison wins, because he deserves to. Well, John Howard, thanks so much for your time. I know you've been, you're dealing with a bit of a lurgy there, so we do appreciate your time today. Thanks, Andrew. Well, John Howard thinks it's a close-run thing, and so do both our political leaders. In fact, it's a sprint to the finish line. Both men cross, crisscrossing the country, visiting a multitude of seats in the final days and hours before polling day. I'm joined now by Ryan Liddell. He was Chief of Staff to Bill Shorten during the last election campaign, and these days he's partner at Principal Advisory. Ryan, hello there. Yeah, friend. And David Alexander, former Liberal Advisor in the Office of the Treasurer, then Treasurer Peter Costello, these days Managing Director at Barton Deacon. David, welcome to you. Hi, Fran. Ryan, two numbers out today, important numbers. Unemployment at 3.9% and a Labor deficit $7.4 billion over four years higher yep. than the Coalition's deficit. Which of those do you think the voters might go for? <laughs> well, I think, um, I, th I think it's a very interesting part to the, this campaign, and we haven't really seen it uh, for a long time. It's the way the economic debate's been reframed around cost of living, the fact that people are talking about wages. People aren't talking about deficits. People aren't talking about debt. People are talking about wages. And I think there's a real sort of risk for the government here that, you know, the more they sort of crow about positive figures, like, you know, 3.9% unemployment, good figure, the more they seem to be out of touch with how, how people are sort of feeling on the ground. Well, there's a real risk there in that respect. The lowest unemployment number in 38 years, though, that nicely yeah. fits on a banner, doesn't it? Sure, no, absolutely, that's right. But I think if you go out there and you talk to people in the street, I think that their lived experience is very different to, you know, seeing a, 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 a fantastic gold shiny number on a banner. Their lived experience is going to supermarkets, not being able to afford to pay for things, or seeing the price of things going up and up while their wages are sort of staying flat. So I think that's a real, that's a real sort of danger there for the government in so far as its economic strategy. David, what do you think? We're really into the last 48, 40 hours now, really, probably until polling day. Do you think either of these numbers on this day makes much of a difference? Because we've already had the wages debate and we know people are pretty attuned to that and the cost of living debate. Well, I think very much that uh, the government will be very heartened by the unemployment figure. I mean, that really hits at the fundamental importance of people's lives, having a job. And you couldn't ask for a better lead-in stat than that. It, it melts the heart of any treasurer. Uh, with the costings, I think Labor have left uh, themselves exposed in a big way by leaving till right on the door knock uh, a debt expansion, deficit expansion, which is the opposite of what is needed at the moment. Only two days ago you saw Jim Chalmers talk about a tidal wave of red ink at the moment. And two days later he comes out 
and he says, well, our debt and deficit is going to be bigger. Now, that obviously doesn't add up, and I think that that will be quite an unpopular move when people are making up their minds, you know, coming to the crunch end of the voting season. Ryan, David's right that, I mean, well, whichever side is in government, there's a tidal wave of red ink coming. We've got a trillion dollar debt looming, sure. no matter who yep. is in government on Monday. But is it risky? Is this a risk of Labor's 7.4 billion over four years? It's not, it's not the biggest number people are expecting that might be higher, but is it risky? Going for, you know, admitting you're going to have a higher deficit? I think people are smart enough to work out that, you know, if you make the investment in productivity enhancing measures, then it sort of pays off. And if you think at the... People are listening that closely? Well, if, you, if, if, they, if you're talking about cheaper childcare, I think they're listening, Fran. Okay. And if you're talking about things that'll put cost of living sort of relief on the table, I absolutely think that they're listening. So I think, you know, uh, Katie and Jim did a, a, did a very good job today of actually making the case for why, you know, there are in, increased investments from, from the Labor side and these sorts of things. Let me ask both of you, you've both been inside the campaigns at this point, 40 hours away from polling day. What's the discussion going on between the strategists and the leaders' offices? What are you planning for the last run to the polls, David? Well, I think the Prime Minister's strategy is just to see as many people as he can in seats that matter and deliver the right messages. And I think coming in to the close, that will be centred around economic management. And I think that's a very strong closing message. Right. Well, I, I tell you what, Fran, if, you know, there'll be some Labor strategists pretty happy if the Prime Minister's strategy is to see as many people as possible in some of those marginal lectures. I'm not sure that he's uh, seen as positively as he would like to think that he is. Um, like, the last 24 hours is basically looking at uh, the, the seats that you can sort of um, either need to send some urgent time sandbagging or you can sort of run in and possibly snatch at the sort of last moment. So I think you'll see over the next sort of, you know, um, 24 hours, uh, you know, a swing from Anthony Albanese through, you know, Two, three, sort of uh, two, three states, uh, focusing on those various sort of marginals and picking out the ones that you know we might be sort of half a chance at winning, and a, and a, and a late push through could actually get us across the line. Yeah, well, Scott Morrison certainly visited every state so far in the last week. He's got South Australia to come. I imagine that might be the magical mystery to tomorrow. But David, if it's the seats that matter, Scott Mo Morrison, let's look at what the leaders have been doing hmm. today. Scott Morrison has been in Lyons in Tassie. He's been in Werriwa in Sydney, so two Labor seats. Werriwa would be a surprise, wouldn't it? It's a 5.5 margin. I've not heard Werriwa mentioned so far. What can we read into that? Well, I think you can read in that he would like to win some seats from Labor, so it's not just purely Werewa? defensive. Werriwa. Uh, what you're seeing a lot of focus on is in... Uh, so-called peri-urban areas, uh -huh. and most people haven't used the word peri-urban <laughs> before this election campaign, but it's referring to... Use it again now. Yeah, outer suburban and, and around the uh, cities. Um, and so I think that's where you're seeing some coalition support for the concerns of people in those peri-urban areas, uh, 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 very direct kitchen table concerns. They're looking for jobs, um, job security, um, traditional kind of values, that sort of thing. So he's playing to his strong suit there. Ryan, is Werriwa peri-urban for a start and is Werriwa <laughs> in play? And if it is, then Parramatta and Fowler might be in play too, mightn't they? I think... Um, is Labor in trouble in these seats? Oh, look, I think the biggest problem for Scott Morrison when he comes to Sydney is the number of seats he has to avoid. So, you know, you think about uh, he can't go to North Sydney, he can't go to Wentworth, haven't really seen him in Reed much, seen him in Benelong a couple of times, but, you know, he's, he's on the nose there as well. So he comes to Sydney, he, he parks himself in, you know, a Werriwa. I don't think that's, that's certainly not a seat that seems to be in play. But someone remarked to me a couple of days ago the reason you see so much of Scott Morrison in Parramatta and the, re and the reason why they're sort of talking up the chances there is not because they're actually in with a chance, it's because there, isn't, there aren't too many places that uh, the Prime Minister can turn up in. So you don't agree with David that this is, I'm going to use the term again, peri-urban strategy in play, you know, the Catherine Deves payoff? Uh, I, I don't know about that, Fran. I think at the end of the day, you know, if, if Scott Morrison wants to spend his time in Werra, good luck to him. OK, and the um, seat of Fowler, Christina Keneally, is, she's been...
put into that seat. Yep. You know, she wasn't the locals' choice. Um, there's some suggestion she's not polling strongly and she could be in trouble there. Well, I think Christine is a star performer and she's sort of seen, like, she's proven that time and time again, both in New South Wales politics and at a, at a federal level. Yeah, she didn't win Ben along, though. Is yeah. she in danger of not winning Fowler? Oh, look, I think it's going to be tough. But, you know, she's been out there on the ground every day, um, you know, door knocking um, at, at the train stations, talking to people, and I think she'd be good. Just to, to stay with Labor for a minute, David, mm. because Albanese, Anthony Albanese started off in Bennelong, then dropped into Peter Dutton's seat in Dixon, then Brisbane, all Liberal seats. Yep. So, you know, if it's the seats that matter, as David said, do that matter? Is a visit to Peter Dutton's seat really just a mind game or is it in play? <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's in play, Fran, but just to your earlier point about Bennelong, you know, I think there's a real problem for the government, uh, particularly in the way they, they, they've talked about China. Um, I think it's a problem when they've, they, they've obviously gone over the top with some of their language in relation to China, calling Richard Miles Manchurian Kanzo, all that sort of rubbish. But the, the, the sort of more acute point is that, as I understand it, there's a, a lot of feedback coming from the Chinese community that um, when they attack uh, China. They're not talking. They're not attacking the Chinese government. They're attacking China, and a lot of people are. A lot of, a lot of people in the Chinese community are seeing that uh, in a very negative way. And I think you might find a significant vote uh, uh, shifting across the Labor Party on account of that. I see it's like Bennelong through Reid, uh, even across the Banks and further south in Victoria and Chisholm. Yeah, David. I was just going to say, are you, are you picking that up? Are you hearing that? Because if if Bennelong's in trouble in Chisholm, which is really really tight, might be in trouble too. Uh, I think there will be some uh, focus on what happens in those seats with uh, populations of high levels of Chinese ancestry um, because, as you say, there has been, over recent years, quite a lot of difficult issues around uh, dealing with the Chinese government. Now, uh, so people will look for whether there's different votes in those booths as compared to the general population. Mm -hmm. And there may well be interpretations out of that. Um, but, you know, I, I think there would probably be some concerns, perhaps, if uh, the wrong interpretations are drawn from that sort of thing. OK. Um, there are always campaign moments, right? We had a couple of big ones in this one. Anthony Albanese for getting the unemployment rate on day one was one. We've talked about that before, Ryan. Scott Morrison had the bulldozer, real Scott moment, David. And yesterday there was this. Whoa, that was rough. I, I, I was at a function last night. Everyone was looking at that. Everyone was laughing about it, talking about it. It's trending on Twitter, trending on TikTok. Both of you have worked on campaigns. How does a moment like this play? Does it play at all, David? Does it mean anything other than laugh? You know, the bulldozer bulldozing down a little kid. I don't mean I don't to laugh at has. poor Luca, but... Yeah, I don't think it has any lasting impact at all. People will mostly, as you say, have a little bit of concern about is the kid OK? And then they'll laugh it off. But that Scobo, he, he likes to, um, he likes to uh, join in with people. You can see it. Uh, people of all walks of life. And he clearly gets enjoyment. There is a bit of a contrast with Elbow there. You see a lot of him in, in rooms and behind lecterns and... Uh, you know, probably he's a nice guy, but he doesn't seem to come across. He doesn't seem to want to do those sort of join-in things. Right, and that's a fair point, isn't it? I mean, everyone's saying that Scott Morrison has won the pictures, won the images of this campaign, that Anthony Albanese hasn't taken the risk. Scott Morrison's in everywhere doing things, making things, baking cakes, all the rest of it. And that video certainly outplayed Anthony Albanese's appearance at the National Press Club, didn't it? What do you think of that moment? Does it matter? Well, as somebody said to me this morning, if only he tackled, tackled cost of living the same way he tackled sort of eight-year-olds, which I think is a little bit cute. But boom, boom. the way the way that I, the way that, the, 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 one thing that comes to mind when I think about this, I think about something that Don Watson wrote about the '93 election. Um, you know, Paul Keating's former speechwriter, and he said that after the '93 election, he, uh, the team sort of thought, well, you know, we thought they were coming it with axes, uh, that they put them back in the shed. But what they what, what they were wrong about was they actually had le left the axes next to the door, and so in '96 they came from again. Um, you know, in 2019, you could argue that Scott Morrison got his reprieve. You know, he got his reprieve, um, so he had three years to sort of become the Prime Minister um, that people thought he could be. He had the national stage uh, with COVID, the pandemic, bring the country through that. But four years after Scott Morrison became Prime Minister, after all that, after everything Australia's um, been through, we're back with the gimmicks, we're back with the stunts, we're back playing 
saying, you know, like a 54-year-old running around with eight-year-olds on a soccer field for the TV cameras, election campaign. I think Australians deserve a little bit better from their leaders. OK, well, we had a tightening of the polls this week. Ryan, I imagine you got a sort of that share of the PTSD that a lot of Labor MPs had, <laughs> I think, uh, given what happened at this time last, last yep. year. But um, really, I'm going to ask each of you, we really have only 30 seconds left each, less than 48 hours to go. Want to make a prediction? Uh, I'm not going to make a prediction given uh, you know what happened last time, but I think uh, if, if you wanted to be anyone, you wanted to be uh, Labor and Anthony Albanese, and I think they run a good campaign. Well, hang Parliament? No, I, 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 think, um, I think it would be a very positive result for Labor on the night. David? Uh, Albo's got his nose in front, but if there's another day tomorrow like there has been today, then Scott could well be in it for a, probably a hung Parliament result. Yeah, OK, so you think if, if the coalition's in the box seat's more likely a hung parliament than outright majority? Yeah. All right. David Alexander, Ryan Liddell, thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure you're kind of sort of quite fraught and quite focused at this moment, both of you. Political warriors, if you have been for your respective parties, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Fran. Thanks, Fran. Yes, well, both of those gentlemen have seen a few elections, but... Ultimately, Fran, it doesn't count for much, does it? The predictions of insiders uh, will only know on Saturday night. I do note, though, Fran, there's a bit of a schedule of late polling to come out. Ipsos is apparently uh, out for publication uh, this evening and into tomorrow in the nine newspapers. So that's, uh, that's still coming. And then I think uh, news poll might leave it until actual voting day on Saturday. Well, that's the one, isn't it? That's the one that gave everyone the fright last year, last election, Greg, the news poll that comes out on Saturday morning. So I think that's the one that um, both sides will be eagerly awaiting. It was interesting to hear John Howard earlier saying he doesn't feel the sort of the mood for change, the tide to change that he admitted he did feel when he was campaigning back in 2007 against Kevin Rudd. But, you know, maybe he would say that, wouldn't he? I, he I don't might, know. But, but the comparison there is rather extreme, isn't it? Because when his number was up, I think... John Howard probably knew that, at least for his government, if not for himself, in the seat of Benelong. I mean, that was an extraordinary year, the, the year of 2007. All momentum for a very long time uh, was there behind Kevin Rudd. There is a pathway for Anthony Albanese that doesn't involve that, that groundswell, but could deliver seven seats nevertheless. There's a pathway and there's the goat track that Scott Morrison was relying on last time and he reckons he can still, those around him say they can still see the goat track now, but we'll know soon enough and we're going to have two hours of this we kind are. of talk tomorrow, Greg. So. Exactly. I'll be joining you there in Sydney. Really looking forward to that, Fran, the last hurrah, two hours. Uh, join us at that time tomorrow. See you later.